read me romance read read me romance read me romance read read me romance you could take a look in a book that's fine or you could sit back relax and unwind and read me romance read read me romance welcome back lady listeners hey welcome back lady listeners we have a brand new book from Shaw Hart. It's called Saddled, which I feel like that just says everything you need it to right there. <laughs> saddle up, nice. saddle in, get ready. We've got a lot of shit to talk about. I'm just kidding. Yeah. So yeah, so we've got a brand new book from Shaw Hart with us. We're so excited to have her on the podcast. Um, yeah, there's lots of stuff to talk about, but we'll get to all her good stuff in just a little bit and we'll play the book with you. But before that, we're just going to chit chat. Um, did you see the photos of Kim Kardashian in the Marilyn Monroe dress? What did you yes. think? I didn't think, <laughs> I thought people's reactions, that's what really I was like, whoa, yeah. whoa, whoa, I know. Like, coming left and right. I'm like, Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I was just, I think I was neutral to it. In fact, mm-hmm. maybe I was more nicer. I was like, you know. Maybe I don't know enough about Marilyn Monroe, but I was just like, to a degree, could Kim Kardashian be the new age kind of Marilyn Monroe to a degree? I can see that. I can see the representation of that. I mean, of I, course she's not. Like, it's, mm-hmm. it's different. It's different times. We have social mm-hmm. media. The way things are done are differently. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I didn't see as harsh as everybody else, especially when I was like, they're like, this is a piece of art. This is history. And I was like, then why is it in Ripley's Believe It or Not? (laughs) I did wonder that too. I was like, Jesus, they got $6 million for a fucking dress. Okay. And I got to, you know, after we're sold, that's after the last year, Ripley's Mm -hmm. Believe It or Not is probably having a few hard years with COVID. Mm -hmm. And I bet you Kim Kardashian gave them a few million dollars to wear it. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. What do you you think? What I think is interesting is, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm neutral on Kim Kardashian. I don't love her, dislike her. She's just a celebrity. Um, I thought it was interesting how the dress fit her because she said she had to lose like 16 pounds to get into it. Which was weird because I thought, yes. I'm guessing it's the ass. A hundred percent the ass. A hundred percent. Because I was surprised how loose it was at the, like in the breast area, like mm-hmm. around her chest, that it was looser than it looked on Marilyn. But, you know, this is, the, again, neutral on Kim K. But I want to go back to Marilyn Monroe for a second because – I think everybody has a really sort of, uh, really, uh, I don't even know how to say it. Like they put her on a pedestal and I don't really under, I never understood the attraction to Marilyn Monroe. I just thought she was an okay actress. I mean, nothing really blew me away. I think the reason she was so popular was maybe the tragic way in which she died. Like, I mean, you know that, but. And because she would wear a dress like that when that was frowned upon. Yeah, I mean, she was sexy, but you have to think she wore that dress mm-hmm. to sing happy birthday to a president mm-hmm. that she was having an affair with. And knew he was married. Yeah, and the wife was there. So yeah. it's just like, I mean, very much like a slap in the face in that sort of respect. I just don't know why Marilyn idolized. That's the word I want to use. I don't know why Marilyn Monroe is so idolized, especially for someone that like had curves. When I think like, okay, like she's probably a size 10 today. You know, no, I think like, it's actually, she's like an, a size eight because the sizes have changed and people have talked maybe about so. it. They were like, because everybody was like, Marilyn Monroe was a 13. And so I heard somebody say, no, well, technically it was this, this, and she was about a size eight. Whatever the reason would be. I understand that maybe back then that that was sort of scantily clad and she was curvy, but I have to think there were larger women back then as well. They just weren't, you know, again, idolized for that sex symbol. So I can see a correlation between, you know, Kim K being like the the sex yeah, symbol and that kind of thing. She pushed the boundary. She pushed mm-hmm. the line for women and what they could wear and what was told no and that, mm-hmm. which I can understand. But then at the same time, she done some kind of, and I don't recall. I know mm-hmm. the Marilyn Monroe did all these things wearing the clothes and all that stuff, but I don't recall her being a huge activist. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, sometimes I feel yeah. like she's treated like she was a huge activist. 
You know, I think if you want to look to uh, something of the kind of the same caliber would be Dolly Parton, someone who was like very sexualized, um, you know, that was often like, you know, made fun of for her body and that kind of thing and the clothes she wears and that sort of stuff. But again, a woman who is, you know, outspoken about her activism and for women and what they should be allowed to do. So it's just interesting to me that Marilyn Monroe was the the choice, but it, maybe that's a generational thing. So I liked that Kim K wore the dress because I thought, fuck it, if anybody's going to wear it, why not her? Who else? Anybody can wear this dress. What's stopping them? You know, Kim K is just the one that did it. And that's what people, that's what makes people mad because she's the one that did it. Yeah. So, but you know, th they're just looking for a reason with her too. You know, it's just like she could breathe wrong and they're just going to put it on a tabloid. What I did find interesting was that um, that I heard about I was on the radio. I was they said something about that there was an incident with Kim K there. And I guess Pete was with her and he was trying to shield her from like the paparazzi or something in an elevator. Did you hear about this? Mm -mm. And like he like stands in front of her and like puts his hands on the mirror like behind her or whatever and like kind of like blocks her body so they can't take pictures of it mm -hmm. and the woman that was on the radio was like it was the hottest fucking thing i've ever seen she was like the way he just like pushes her up against the elevator and like puts his arms on the side of her and blocks her and i was like why have i not found this gift yet why have i not unearthed that this super hot, i know i was like yes i don't there's just something about him I love. And so I don't know. I but do remember I one person. Sorry. I do no, remember no. one person saying that they think some of the things she was doing to get in the dress was like damaging the young girls because she was like, I only ate chicken and clean vegetables to fit into this. And mm -hmm. I looked to wear this or whatever, but I guess yeah. they're always saying that kind of shit. Yeah, true. And I, I mean, I don't know. Like, I didn't uh, think it was as big a deal as everybody was making. They were like going nuts, and that's and that's why I was like, okay, if you guys think this is such a piece of history, again, why, <laughs> why is, is it Ripley's? Yes, why is it not in the Smithsonian with Jackie Kennedy's? You know, why not with her dress from the inauguration? Like. Why is it next to, you know, all these other, like, really wax figures or stuff? Or yeah, whatever. I know. It's interesting, yeah, that, that they have it, and it's not in a museum with other, like I said, I mean, Jackie O, like, her, like, lavender suit with the pillbox hat mm -hmm. from Kennedy's inauguration, that's in the Smithsonian. You can go see it right now. The fucking puffy shirt from Seinfeld is in the Smithsonian. Is it really? Yes, it I is. I've seen it that's there. Yeah. So, but, you know, there's stuff like that, so... What I did think was sad was this year, Chloe did get invited. I don't think she's been invited before. And she looked great. I thought mm -hmm. she looked great. I actually thought all the Kardashians, except for Courtney's outfit, I didn't see looked him. cool. I liked mm -hmm. Kendall was wearing this, like, um, or Kylie was wearing this huge, like, puffy wedding dress and had these cute little mesh sleeves. And she actually had a ball cap on backwards and it had a veil that came down a little bit, so like this. I don't know. I thought it was interesting looking. Okay. Like, it's kind of cute. Mm -hmm. And her sister had a black one. It kind of matched. But mm -hmm. Chloe looked good. She came in this almost like her sister's dress, but more modern. Yeah. This gold thing and these gloves. And mm -hmm. she looked sexy in it. And I just find it so sad that everybody is like, she gets her invitation to the Met Gala for the first time. And mm -hmm. everybody's saying she's never looked hotter. But I'm like... She's never been skinnier. Oh, yeah. Well, a lot of people equate that with beauty. I know. I was just like, that's got to, like, mess with her head. Like, 100%. And I feel like she has to be starving when I look at her. Because mm -hmm. she is not built to be that small. Mm -hmm. I just don't feel like, she, yeah, when I look at her, mm. I feel like she's not, she's so tiny. Like, I'm like, I it almost looks painful. Have you ever looked at somebody really skinny and you're like, yeah, it's painful. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I mean, a lot of people can't help being super skinny, but with her, it's definitely a lifestyle choice. Yeah. So, you know, but there's something I was looking at earlier today where it was talking about, you know, just the diet culture of, you know, our parents in that generation and, you know, they showed a video and it's so funny because I had this. It was called Get in Shape Girl and it was for little girls. It was like for 
six to maybe 10 years old. Mm -hmm. And it was a cassette with a workout on it. And you got like a sweat band and like arm bands and stuff. And like this little thing to like exercise with <laughs> to give a seven year. Can you imagine doing no. that now? No. I got that for one of my birthdays. Because it was just so normalized. Like that, that whole thing was just like, that's, I wanted it. Like yeah. that's what I wanted for my birthday. I remember really wanting that specific gift. You know, that's what's, it's crazy to me looking back. But, you know, I saw, um, I, you know, another friend of mine was having this conversation and she was saying that like, she was talking about like the trauma and stuff and, you know, of diet culture and things like that. And she said her mom was just really quiet while she was having the discussion and she said, you know, afterwards that her mom was like, seeing you guys have this conversation opened my eyes to what our generation has done. Mm -hmm. And she said, and it makes me feel like I should be stronger and I should be more vocal about the things that were done to me from my, mm -hmm. you know, from that childhood. So it's like, you know, I, I don't blame, you know, the, the generation before me because we're only as educated as we are in this moment. You know, we can't be, you know, educated about the future because it hasn't happened. Yeah. So, you know, we're only as educated as we are right now. So we use the tools we have to do the best that we can. But this is undoing generational trauma. If you can talk about this openly and speak it out loud and have a parent or someone else in a different generation recognize this. This one does trauma for our own kids. Yeah, definitely. You know, I actually had an example of this tonight, and it didn't have to do with food or anything like that or weight. But there was a moment when we were eating ice cream at dinner or after dinner was over. I was cleaning the kitchen. The kids had an ice cream cone. And my youngest one, I had put a marshmallow in the bottom of the cone before I put the ice cream on it because she loves that because the ice cream gets down with the marshmallow mm -hmm. and it gets cold and melty. It's awesome. Anyways, so she's eating it and she's kind of making this funny noise when she does it because she's just enjoying it. And my oldest one looks over and she was like, oh, you sound like a pig. And when she said it, like, I know she was trying to be funny because the sound she was making sounded like a pig. Mm -hmm. And Hallie got really upset and got super teary eyed. And I was like, Lydia, you need to apologize. And she was like, well, that's not what I meant. And I was like, this is a teachable moment right here, guys. Mm -hmm. I said, what you said hurt her. It doesn't matter what you intended. Mm -hmm. It's what she felt and what she heard. And then she was trying to argue with me. She was like, well, I didn't mean to. I'm sorry. Like, I, that's not what I meant. And I said, no, no, no. There doesn't have to be an argument. All you have to do is apologize and recognize that what you said was not what she heard and validate her feelings. And if you do that, it's the end of it. Yeah. And she was just kind of like, oh. It was like that hadn't occurred to her. That's all she has to do is validate those feelings and it's over. Yeah. You're not and really I, saying that you were wrong. You're saying, oh, yeah. I, I, I'm sorry I hurt you. Yeah. Yeah. But it's the, you just like, oh, it was you never a joke. Hurt her. Yeah. yeah. But it's one of those things where it's like if you don't have that that whole conversation and you just let it slide, it's those little things, I think, or I felt, mm -hmm. that just build up and build up and build up until you have no self-confidence, no self-esteem. You know, you feel like people make fun of you all the time. You're insecure. Like, it's those little things that dig and dig and dig because nobody ever stood up and stood in front of that for you. Yeah. You know, like no parent or whoever ever got in front of you and stopped the person that was doing it. And that's what I saw in that moment was if I didn't move in front of that and say something, it was just going to get gone. And then Hallie yeah. was just going to go to bed with these hurt feelings. Yeah. And, and it's strange the little things that you little moments like that that you remember mm -hmm. when you look back. For sure. Kid. That it's those, so those little these, comments. Yeah. yeah. These little nuggets that nobody mm -hmm. else would ever remember that just kind of set that'll them. stay with you forever. Yeah. So it's, you know, again, it's one of those things where I'm like, you know, I could have not said anything because she's seven, Lydia's 11, like they're going to annoy each other. Shit's going to happen like that. But the more that that's normalized, the more that that breaks trauma. Yeah. So that's, if anything, I could reiterate that to everyone out there listening. It doesn't have to be a child. It can be anyone in your life yeah. when you see this happen, you know, to, to speak it out loud really is change, I think. So, um, Mother's Day this weekend. 
do you have any plans? <laughs> Are you doing anything for Mother's Day? I don't have any plans. No, I actually forgot about it entirely <laughs> until I saw an ad on Facebook. And I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> I didn't forget. Like, I sent my mom her flowers. But mm -hmm. I'm like, I know. I, I asked Rob to do something for me. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what it was, though. Oh, I <laughs> I asked him, I was like, one of the things I wanted was, oh, I wanted him to put the rest of the chandelier pieces up on some of the, sh the lights that we hung up. Yeah, uh -huh. Like all the pieces haven't been, but it's just time consuming. Yeah, to yeah. Just sit there and put them all. Mm -hmm. So I was like, for Mother's Day, I would like you to <laughs> give him a chore. So. I remember Hallie has two little ones in her room. She has these little light bulbs and they're, they'll have chandeliers around them. And I remember when the electricians were here and they were, you know, redoing the house, they had to rewire the whole house and put in all the um, light fixtures. And I remember him saying those two little chandeliers, he could have gotten the whole house done in the time it took him to do those. Mm -hmm. Even though they were tiny, he was like well, the hooks and wires and everything. It's just so time consuming. Well, somebody pointed it out to me. They were like, well, before you mounted the thing, you should have put them on there first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like my dad would have probably broke them and they would have been falling out. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, that's easy to say, though, afterwards when it goes in safely and right the first time. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't have any plans um, for Mother's Day. I just hope that I don't have to do laundry. <laughs> that's all. <laughs> that's the only thing I just don't want to. I don't want to do laundry or dishes. Like, just give me one day off. Okay. Just give me one yeah. day. Um, also on my list of stuff to talk about, um, I wanted to ask that summer is coming up and there's this thing in my town and that, uh, they've opened it up recently. It's called the hive and it's a shared office space. And I think they have, it maybe not this necessarily the name of it, the hive, but they have spaces like this everywhere. But, um, it is a, an old house that they converted into an office and so upstairs, there's two offices that you can rent that people pay like full time rent. And then you can um, become a member of the Hive and it's like 80 bucks a month and you can come and use their facilities anytime you want. It's 24 seven. They have open office space. They have conference rooms. You just have to schedule like you need to see clients or you have a meeting. Like let's say you work from home and you want to have a meeting, but you don't want everybody to come to your home. This yeah. is a space that you can rent to do this. So upstairs, there's one big office they call it the Queen Bee, and it's like fifteen hundred a month or something like that for the office space. And there's a smaller one that's like eight hundred a month. And then the little like yeah, anybody can come come downstairs. There's like a kitchenette. There's like you know desks and stuff. There's outdoor seating and space. So I thought this was so cool though, especially for people working at home in the summertime with their kids at home. Yeah. So. I was like, this is fantastic. I'm going to try this out this summer and see because I thought like, okay, I can run at home if I get up like really early and stuff before the kids are up and running around. And You, you know, impress the hell out of me sometimes when you get up and you're done so early. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just know some days that I have to or I'll just get so behind and mm -hmm. I won't be able to do it till like seven o'clock. And then I feel like a jerk because you get it late, you know. So, I write so late though. I know, but I know you don't want to get it at seven o'clock and then still have to write. Sometimes it's nice to get it early and marinate on it. Yeah, you know? I, I, that's one thing I do like to yeah. do because then mm -hmm. when I'm running errands or working, you'll down, be thinking think about it. it. Yep, yeah. I know. So, but yeah, this place is really cool. Like I said, you can also rent the conference room just for the day. So, one of my friends who was telling me about it, she is part of like this. Um, this school thing that does field trips and stuff. And they had to have a meeting with their directors. And she was like, I went to this place. They were like, Oh, meet us at the hub. And she was like, the what? And she said, yeah, they had rented out the conference room for like four hours. And when we went up there, we had our meeting and that was it. And we left. And I was like, that is so smart for yeah. like a shared office space. So I, I just thought that was, you know, like I said, with summer and everything coming up, it was just kind of good timing to, to be like, Hey, you know what? I'm going to try this out and see how it goes. So I was like for 80 bucks a month, like to, to know I have a space I can go to. Cause there is a coffee shop here, but it's really busy. Like yeah. every time. And there's hardly any seats when I go in, like it's Our really Starbucks busy. Our Starbucks are like that. 
I'll see people working in them and I'm like, God, how they and I'm one that's so just, loud. I am pretty good with sound around me and mm-hmm. it still annoys me. Yeah, I can't it's because there's just so much chit chat. It's not like just quiet working. It's people talking, having conversations, calling out names. Like that to me isn't a conducive writing environment. Like I could probably go and like answer emails, but if I had to like focus on something, I'd never get it done. I'd never yeah. get a chapter done. I'd just sit there and spin my wheels all day. So this is kind of cool that there's like and they have like a quiet rule in there they were like if you're on your phone or whatever for more than a minute you need to go outside or whatever if there's a conference room go you know if a conference is going on keep the door shut like that kind of thing so I thought that was kind of cool that it's just like a respectful workplace but you don't have to do anything (laughs) like you just go in when you want I could literally go right now if I wanted to so that's kind of cool too I'm like well what if my internet fucks up I guess I could go there yeah it's actually a really cool concept. I know. I was thinking about it. I was like, your dad should do something like I this. I know. It's the same thing. I was like, <laughs> I want to tell my dad about this. It's just an mm-hmm. interesting yeah. idea. It is. It's really cool. And like the people that work there, you or that are members or whatever, you get your own designated mailbox. So you could have that as your business address. Like, so again, if you, you know, work from home or if you have a small business and you don't want that to be like done in your home, this is a great place to go and maybe not make your product, but again, to have meetings or clients or even do Zoom calls or something if you don't want to do them in your house, like that kind of thing. Yeah, I'd I be curious really cool. to know how big it is and if they have a limit like they're like okay we have this many members we Mm -hmm. can't have any more we're not gonna have i don't know i can always ask i know that they like i said they have two offices upstairs they converted the house into that so and then the other spaces there's two there's uh one huge conference room there's another room that has like a bunch of chairs and tables kind of like a study area for like Mm -hmm. you know a bunch of people and then there's there's um it's kind of like a like a big dining room living area where there's a kitchenette and then there's like a couple of tables here like a coffee shop okay so yeah that's kind of how it's set up and then there's outdoor seating there's like just tables and chairs outside that are set up and it's literally like you could walk in and anywhere in there as long as somebody's not sitting down just sit and go to work you should hit that place with your girl scout cookies <laughs> That's actually a good idea. You know, it's like two blocks from here, too. Like really? It's, it's literally, I could walk to it from I my house. I would take a walk there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, we're, and we're right downtown, too. So, it's like up 2nd Street. So, yeah. It's just like right over there. Mm-hmm. It's just a really cool concept. So, anyways, if, if you're considering something like this or you have a small business and you want to expand but don't want to invest in a huge monthly business rent, you know, every month, like, I mean, there's no way I'd spend, you know, $1,500 a month on rent. Like that's tax right off. Yeah. Yeah, it is. (laughs) So that's kind of nice. But, um, but yeah, there's no way I'd, I'd want to spend $1,500 on the office space. If I have a designated office at home, that makes no sense. You know, I can write at home. It's fine. You know, but I don't feel like I'm pressured to go there either. Yeah. If I feel like pressured, then I won't want to do it. It's like when you used Uh to get arcs. (laughs) <laughs> and when you felt like you had to read it, you no longer wanted to read yes, it. Yes, <laughs> exactly. When you're required to do it. So, yeah, I mean, this is just nice, uh, you know, for summertime and stuff. If I get frustrated, I mean, at least for a few months, you know, it's nice and quiet when the kids are at school. But, man, those summer days when they get bored and they get rowdy, fuck my life. So, all right, let's talk a little bit about Shaw Hart. Um, she's brought us, like I said, the brand new book, Saddled. Um, let me read her author bio. USA Today bestselling author Shaw Hart writes contemporary and new adult romance. She loves writing insta-love romances that always end in happily ever afters. She lives in a constant state of motion, chasing after her two children and three dogs. Shaw enjoys the simple things in life, like spending time with her family and friends. When she's not doing that, she's reading romance books, watching stand-up comedy, or crime TV shows. Her favorite book tropes are secret baby and boss employee romance. She's a Pinterest addict, dog lover, tea snob, and wannabe yogi. That's cute. Wannabe yogi. Uh huh. All right. This is the bio for Saddled. Uh, yeah. She's a princess locked away in a wooden tower. Twyla Grace should love her life. She has a nice house, a wealthy father, and just graduated from college. What more could a girl want? For Twyla, the answer has always been Seth. He's always wanted to oh be my God, her I think wife. Oh my God, I think sex. <laughs> 
<laughs> that too. <laughs> He's always wanted to be her white knight. When Seth Avery first met Twyla, he instantly knew two things. One, she was the one for him. And two, she was also way too good for him. When she, when she left, he let her go. He thought that college was what she wanted. And he just wanted her to be happy. Do the princess and the pauper only get their happily ever after in fairy tales? Now that she's back in Sequoia, though, will Seth be able to let her go again? All right. So Saddled is tied to the Sequoia Stud Farm series, which I just love so much. Um, that whole series releases later this year. Um, and for the giveaway, she is doing a signed paperback this week. So make sure you check that out. I'm so shocked that she hasn't been. I feel like she's on the podcast. <laughs> I know. I like was loading her stuff and mm -hmm. into our website. I was going to copy the old one and change some of the information. Uh -huh. Yeah. But I was like, she's not in here. I thought this was like her second time on here. I don't like no. So. No? Maybe I just see her all the time. I was going to say, I, I read her too. So I can't I'm just go like, anywhere and not see her, which is great. That's what you want. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. But I was sure <laughs> she had, but maybe you're right. Maybe it's just because I see her everywhere mm -hmm. and I read her and stuff. So, all yeah, right. for sure. All right. Well, let's send him to the first installment. All right. We'll see you guys on the other side. Bye. This is Saddled by Shaw Hart. Read for you by Ramona Master. Chapter 1 Twyla The car ride home is silent, but I don't mind. I've never had much to say to my father. Not since I was a kid, anyway, and that hasn't changed with my time away at college. I'm too wound up to try to make idle chit-chat right now, or to try to fill the awkward silences. Not when I'm so close to being back home and seeing Seth. I wonder if he's still working at the stud farm. I've had that same thought a million times over the last four years, and the answer is always yes. Seth Avery not being the foreman of the stud farm is basically a ludicrous thought. He's been working there for the last six years. I know because I've kept in touch with Grizz Ford, one of the Ford brothers and one of his bosses ever since I left. Usually it's just a happy holidays text or him asking how classes are going. It always ends the same way. With me asking how things are going around the farm and him saying good while somehow finding a way to mention Seth. He has no idea how much I appreciated those texts. I've been in love with Seth since the moment I saw him. I was hiding in my treehouse like I did on most days after school when I saw him moving around in the cabin across the field. He was moving in that day and had taken his shirt off before he carried in the next few boxes. I watched him from my treehouse window as he headed in and out of the cabin. I still don't know what caused him to look up at me. Maybe he was just stretching or maybe he felt my eyes on him. Our gazes had clashed, and we both froze. I don't know what it was in that moment, but I knew that he was it for me. I've never felt very connected to anyone around me. We're the rich family in Sequoia, surrounded by working-class people and farmers. I think that my dad likes it that way. Being a big fish in a small pond, I mean. He raised me to not really interact with the riffraff, as he calls them. He couldn't stop me from hanging out and trying to make friends at school. But I was always the weird girl who wasn't allowed to have friends over or go to their houses. It stopped bothering me how alone I felt or what people said about me when I was 12. Or at least that's what I tell myself. One moment with Seth, though, and those feelings all vanished. He was my white knight coming to save me from the wooden tower that I was locked away in. I moved first, ducking behind the wooden wall so that he couldn't see me anymore. I hid from him for the next week. Then, one day, I headed out to my treehouse, and there he was. 
He had picked me wildflowers and had introduced himself. From there, we talked for a few minutes every time that we saw each other. I kept waiting for him to ask me out, but he never did. I can see now that it was probably because I was only 17 when we met, and he was five years older than me. Then I was getting ready to leave for college. I think that's why I'm so excited to have graduated and to be back home. I need to see if Seth will finally make a move or if all of this has just been in my head. The Russo son is supposed to be back from Japan next week. I'll set up a time for you two to meet, my father announces as we pull into our driveway and my stomach cramps at the thought. My father has been obsessed with marrying me off to the nearest available rich bachelor for as long as I can remember. I've met so many of his friend's sons at this point that they're all starting to blend together. They're all the same anyway. Spoiled dicks who care more about their bank accounts or egos than anything else. I have no interest in any of them, but I can't tell my dad that. He would assume that paying for my college was a waste of money. I would have to agree, but that's mainly because it wasn't really a university that was focused on education. My father picked one of the only finishing colleges left in America to send me to. It was a waste of his money and my time. I have no intention of ever being the perfect society wife. We pull up to the house, and I try to hide the dread that I'm feeling at being back in this place. It's cold and empty in there, but I force myself to follow after my father up the front steps and inside. Everything is exactly as I remember it, and I head upstairs to my room to drop off my bags. The room matches the rest of the mansion, and that means that it never really felt like mine. It's cold. Impersonal. Everything is white and pristine, and it feels more like a museum than a place where you could relax. There's no clutter, no mementos. It's not a kid's room. It's a guest room. I spin on my heels and run down the back stairs and out the side door there. There. Across the field is the tree with my treehouse. It's just at the border of the forest that separates our property from the stud farm. I take off, running across the field toward the tree. As I get closer, I wonder if it will still be safe enough to climb up the stairs. I slow to a walk as I get closer to the tree line and look up at the treehouse. It's obvious that someone has been taking care of the thing and I don't need to wonder who could have done it. My dad never liked that I'd spent so much time up in a tree, so he wouldn't have kept it up for me. That leaves only Seth. He knows how much this old treehouse means to me, and I think that he's the only one who knows about it, since it's far off the edge of the stud farm property. I smile as I climb up the wooden steps and up into the treehouse, The place is bare since I packed up everything that was up here before I left for college. I move over to the far wall, leaning my back against it and stretching out my legs. I can see through the open window and over to Seth's cabin. All of the lights are off, and I know that he must be busy working. Then, to my surprise, the front door opens and Seth steps out onto the porch, Our eyes lock and my breath stalls out in my lungs. He's still just as handsome as I remember. His eyes are still as green as the tree leaves. His dark brown hair is longer than the last time that I saw him. And I wonder if that's the new style or if he's just been too busy to get it cut. I know that they're as green as the tree leaves. He smiles, his teeth flashing in the sunlight and a shiver runs down my spine as he continues to stare at me. When he takes a step toward me, my heart starts to race in my chest. Could this finally be the summer that I tell him how I feel? My mind flashes back to my father telling me about his friend's son, and I grimace. I don't want that life. I want Seth. So maybe I should tell him.
After all, what do I have to lose? Chapter 2 Seth She's home. That was my first thought when I woke up this morning. And I've been anxious and distracted all damn day because of her pending arrival. I've been in love with Twyla since the first day I saw her. She was too young for me then, not even legal yet. But even seven months later, when she turned 18, I didn't make my move. She was so excited to go off to college, and I knew that if I tied her to me, I would only be weighing her down. I didn't want to saddle her with my life if she wanted something more. I want her to experience all that she wants. But now that she's back in Sequoia, I'm at my breaking point. I'm going to claim her. I can't do another four years without her, so if she leaves again, I'm going with her. I love my life here as the foreman of the stud farm. But I would give it all up for a chance to be with my Twyla. I pass by Grizz Ford, one of the Ford brothers and therefore one of my bosses, as I head out of the full barn. Hey, he greets me with an easy smile. How's it going? Good. I just got back from town. I put up the help wanted signs for the summer today, so we should be getting some more help around here soon, he tells me, and I nod. Every summer, he goes to the local college and a few other hotspots in town and puts up the signs. We always get a ton of applicants, probably because jobs can be scarce in a college town that's full of young kids all looking for work. Let me know if you need help with any of the interviews or training, I tell him, and he nods, looking over toward the Grace property. Think she's back home yet? He asks quietly and my heart leaps. I don't know. I haven't seen any cars go by, I admit. And he gives me a knowing smile. I shrug, and he just laughs. It's obvious now that I was working in the full barns this morning so that I could keep an eye out for her, and he knows it. Why don't you take a half day today? I know that it's a big day for you. Wyatt, Kai, Remy, and I can handle things for a little bit. Are you sure? I ask. But I'm already starting to back up toward my truck. Yeah. Go get your girl, he says with a grin. And I wave, calling out a thanks as I jog over to my truck and climb behind the wheel. I'm not surprised that Grizz knows how I feel about Twyla. I'm pretty sure that everyone with eyes knows I'm in love with her. Everyone except Twyla, that is. Dust kicks up behind me as I head down the side road that leads to my secluded little cabin. It's close to the Grace's property and gives me enough privacy that I don't feel like I'm always at work. The cabin is a one-story ranch, nothing too fancy, but it suits my needs, and I get the feeling that Twyla has always liked it, too. It's close enough to her beloved treehouse that I can look out my front windows and see it. I look up as I park in front of my place, but the treehouse is empty and the Grace's house across the field seems to be quiet. Not that that's much of a change. That house is always dead quiet. I used to wonder how it could be with a spitfire like Twyla living there. Then I met her father. Daniel Grace is a real piece of work. That's a nice way of saying that he's an enormous dick. He bosses everyone around and looks down his nose at anyone who works for a living. Everyone in town knows that he didn't work for his wealth, though. He inherited it from his daddy, who inherited it from his daddy, who was some kind of gold prospector a long, long time ago. I'm the exact opposite. I grew up poor, the only child of Lucinda Avery. I never knew who my father was. My mom wouldn't talk about him, and he never bothered to be added to the birth certificate. I was used to being overlooked, 
Teachers never thought I would amount to much. My classmates were all too interested in the football players, and we were too broke for me to play any sports or participate in any after-school activities. Instead, I worked. I worked before school, flipping sausage patties at McDonald's, and after school, bagging groceries at the tiny market by our apartment. Neither offered a great wage, but it helped with the bills. Suffice to say that I didn't date in high school. No one paid me any attention back then. Hell, they didn't, even after I landed in Sequoia. No one has ever truly seen me. Until Twyla. Her name sends tingles down my spine, and I head inside and make quick work of getting washed up. I don't want to be covered in dirt when I see her again. I dry my hair off as I walk out of the shower, and I can't help but sneak another peek at the treehouse. My breath stalls in my lungs when I see her climbing up the stairs. And I'm glad I took the time to replace the old wooden steps for her a few weekends ago. I tug on clean clothes and shove my feet back into my boots before I head outside to join her. She leans against the back wall and our eyes meet. Just like that, that sensation in my chest is back. Looking at Twyla feels like coming home, which is strange because I've never really had one of those. Not until I came to the stud farm. Welcome back, I call up to her, and she smiles. Thanks. Are you done working for the day already? She asks as she crawls over to the edge of the treehouse. Yeah. Grizz gave me the rest of the day off. I don't tell her that it's because he knew I couldn't wait to see her. That was nice. Are you all settled back in, I ask, nodding across the field toward the cold mansion that she lives in. Kind of. I dropped my bags off anyway, she says. And I notice that she doesn't seem too thrilled to be back. How is college? I try, and she frowns at that question too. It was fine, she mumbles, and I wonder if something happened while she was gone. I've been keeping up with her on social media. I don't understand the stuff at all, but if I type in her name, pictures and updates of her pop up, so I suffer through it. I know that she never dated anyone, barely went out to parties, or posted pictures that weren't of her in her dorm room or the library. What are your plans now that you've graduated? I try, and she looks off into the forest. I don't know yet. She sounds so sad, and I hate it. I've fixed up the treehouse for you. I figured that you'd be back here first thing, I say patting one of the steps, and she grins. <laughs> you know me too well, she jokes. And I want to tell her that I want to know everything about her. She throws her legs over the side, and I bite my lip as she starts to climb down toward me. Her juicy ass wiggles as she steps down, and I bite my lip to hold back my groan. She's close enough for me to reach now, and I want to grab her and hold her against me. I want to kiss her throw her down onto the ground, and bury myself inside her. I want to make her mine. Twyla, her father shouts from the back door, and we both sigh at the sight of him. It must be time to eat, she says apologetically, and I smile. She stares at me for a beat, and I can't do it. I can't hold myself back any longer. I step forward my hand grabbing hers to hold her in place as I lower my mouth to hers. The kiss is over way too fast for my liking. But I know that I can't kiss her the way I want to when her father is still staring across the field at us. I open my eyes to see a sweet blush staining her cheeks. She looks a little shell-shocked by my kiss, but in a good way. I trail my lips along her cheek and her fingers tense around mine. Meet me back here tonight at midnight. I whisper against the shell of her ear 
and she shivers. Okay, she whispers back, and my cock hardens at the breathy sound. My heart soars. This is it. This is my chance with her, and I'm not going to mess it up. I let her hand drop when her father calls her name again. His tone even more annoyed at him having to repeat himself. Tonight, I tell her, and she nods once before she takes off across the field toward her house. I watch her go, already mentally counting down the hours until midnight. I have a lot of work to get done before then, and as soon as Twyla disappears inside her house, I head back into mine to get set up. I turn and see Remy riding toward me. He's the oldest brother and most reserved. He slows the horse's gait as he gets near me, and I look up to meet his eyes. Out for a ride? Yeah, he says, his voice gruff. She's home. He nods to where Twyla just disappeared, and I nod. Yeah, just got back today. He nods again, looking back toward the forest as he mulls something over. You know, you have some time off that you could use, he murmurs, and I blink. I shouldn't be surprised. Remy is the most observant out of the four brothers, so of course he knows how I feel about Twyla. Thanks. I might take you up on that, I say. And he gives me a tight-lipped smile before he turns and heads back toward his ranch. Good luck, he calls over his shoulder. And I smile as I head back into my place. I'm not going to need luck. I never have. I've worked for everything that I've ever wanted. And that's not any different here. I'm going to work hard to show Twyla that I'm the only man for her. I just hope that that's enough. Chapter 3 Twyla I'd been staring at the clock for hours. My father and I ate dinner in silence, the only sound the constant ticking from the clock hands as they slowly moved around. It was unbearable. I excused myself as soon as I could and ran back to my room. But hanging out there wasn't any better. I could see out the window to the treehouse and Seth's cabin, and it was driving me crazy. I wanted it to be time for us to meet already. Now that it's almost midnight, and I'm tiptoeing out the back door to go meet Seth, all that I can wonder is if he's going to kiss me again tonight. I wasn't really prepared for it when he did it earlier. I wish that it had lasted longer, or that I at least could have kissed him back before he pulled away. I pulled the door closed quietly behind me, and then I'm off. The moonlight helps me see as I run across the field toward the treehouse. I can already see a few lanterns up in the treehouse, and I smile as I slow to a walk at the edge of the field. I can make out Seth moving around above me, and I bite back a grin as I start to climb up the stairs. Whoa, I say, as I see all that he's done. Hey, Seth says as he turns to me with a gentle smile. You did all of this? I ask, as I look around at the treehouse. It's transformed from an empty space into a cozy, enchanting area. He's hung lanterns and some twinkle lights around the ceiling. An iPad is set up on a small step stool against one wall. And there are blankets and pillows covering the floor. I crawl across them to lean back against the wall opposite the iPad. I wanted tonight to be special, Seth says as he sits down next to me. My body warms, and I wonder if it's possible that Seth is even half as interested in me as I am in him. A vision of us living together in his cabin pops into my head. I could wait on the front porch for him to come back every day. We could have kids. I bet that he would be the best dad. I clear my throat, looking away from him and around the treehouse. It's beautiful in here. Thanks for doing all of this. It's not a big deal. You deserve the best. I thought that maybe we could watch a movie. Or just talk some more. 
Sure. I meant to ask you earlier how things have been around here since I've been gone. Pretty much the same. Grizz, Kai, Remy, and Wyatt are all still at the stud farm and single. We got a few new horses since you've been gone. Sold some of the ones that were trained. He shrugs, and I smile. It's somehow comforting to know that while my whole life changed when I went away to college, that things back here stayed the same. I have no idea what will happen next for me. Maybe I'll stay in Sequoia, or maybe I'll go back to the East Coast. Though I can't see my dad letting that happen. I can't see myself settling down with anyone that my father approves of. But I know that I might not get a choice in who I marry. Seth reaches over, his hand resting on my knee, and I wonder if he's picked up on my change in mood. He squeezes me in a comforting way, and I smile at him, though it's a little forced. How about a movie? Seth asks, changing the subject, and I nod. Sure. What did you have in mind? I'll let you pick. He grabs the iPad and I start to flip through the movies on Netflix. Nerves start to hit me as I look through all the choices. Should I pick a romance? Or maybe an action movie? I bite my lip and keep scrolling. Then my eyes snag on a romantic comedy that I've been dying to see. And before I can talk myself out of it, I click to start playing. Seth sets it back on the step stool and leans back against the wall next to me. It's natural when he moves to put his arm around me, and I sigh as I settle against his side. I fit perfectly, and I smile as I lean my head against his shoulder. Popcorn, he asks, and I nod, taking the bowl as he passes it to me. We relax, falling into a comfortable silence as we watch the movie. We make quick work of the popcorn, and Seth passes me a bottle of water from next to him. When the couple on screen kisses for the first time, I can't help but wonder if Seth will kiss me again tonight. I lick my lips, shifting against his side, and he tightens his hold on me. I try to relax and get back into the movie, but watching the two characters stripping each other and crashing down onto a bed has made me more aware of where my body presses against Seth's. I can't seem to stop squirming against his side. My whole body feels like it's overheating and I can't stop fidgeting. I tug at my shirt, pulling the hem down and twisting the fabric in between my fingers. Are you all right? Why did you kiss me earlier? I blurt out, and we both stare at each other in surprise. I had no idea that that's what was about to come out of my mouth, but now I can't take it back. I've wanted to kiss you since the moment that I met you, Seth says slowly. Really? Of course. I'm in love with you, Twyla. I have been since I met you. These past four years without you have been torture. I don't know what your plans are next for you, but wherever you're going, I want to go with you. I can't be away from you again. He looks like he's holding his breath, and I feel like I'm dreaming. Did he really just say all of that? I want you too. I've been in love with you all of these years too, but I thought that you didn't feel the same way. I did, he says right away as he turns to face me. We stare at each other, both of us grinning like lunatics at the other. My mind races, and I lick my bottom lip. What happens now? I ask, and he smiles as he cups my face and lowers his mouth to mine. Welcome back. Hey, welcome back. So, like I said, make sure you check out um, the Sequoia Stud Firm series. She's got out later this year. Um, and make sure you enter this week's giveaway for a signed paperback. Um, and also, just check our social media because Shaw Hart has an incredible amount of books. 
Yeah. So if you like this, you're going to love everything. And she's got a huge backlist for you to dive through. So make sure you check all that good stuff out. And I guess that's it. We'll see you back here Thursday for the second half. All right. Tell them what to do. Fuck your day up. Make today your bitch. Don't be a dick. Bye, guys. Bye. Read me romance. Read, read me romance. Read me romance. Read, read me romance. You could take a look in a book that's fine. Or you could sit back, relax, and unwind. And read me romance. Read.